uh, this is lecture three of ST589, Fundamentals of Information Technology. <clears throat> this lecture, we're just going to talk about word processing, a little history and so forth. And we're going to talk about assignment one to uh, make things a little more clear, specific, what I'm looking for in that first assignment. <clears throat> Here, what, here's what we're going to cover in this recording. If I can get it to come up here, one second. All right. We're going to talk about a little bit about the history of word processing, only because it, it's kind of interesting in the sense that it's a history of computers, in a sense. We're going to talk about uh, word processors, a couple of the different ones, and just give you a list of things if you're interested, or if you want to talk about these things with your students, you'll have a resource. Uh, and then we're going to talk about um, how it happens on the computer. And I think this is going to be good because it will give you some background on what we're going to cover later on, but it's going to give you a clear, <clears throat> uh, you're going to have a stake in it. In other words, it's going to be what you're doing, and you're going to have some, a little bit of understanding of how that's happening. What we're going to cover tonight isn't going to be uh, uh, comprehensive on how it happens because we're going to talk more about that later. Tonight, I just want to kind of introduce some of the ideas via word processing. Well, then we're going to talk specifically about your assignment, requirements, and so forth. Then I'm going to go through some um, actual formatting in Word uh, related to the assignment. So you kind of have a tutorial. I'm going to try not to do all your work for you, but I'm going to try to give you a head start, give you a guide, a pathway to follow. <clears throat> Word processing through the ages, as I put it here. Um, many consider the typewriter the first word processor. I guess it was in a sense. It's analog. You remember we've talked a lot about analog digital in this class already, and I'm going to continue to talk about it. It's analog because it's essentially the typewriter was a printer on a piece of paper, but you got to control the printer in human real time. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Then there was such a thing as a line editor, where you actually, were, a line was displayed and you had to modify it below the line. We'll talk a little bit about that in text editors. And what we have now today, what you're used to, word processors, screen processors is, was an early word, <clears throat> and they're GUI. You remember what GUI is, graphical user interface. Um, Word processors. Start with a typewriter here. If my slide will change up for me, there we go. I assume all of you have seen price, uh, typewriters, um, or at least heard of them conceptually. Uh, and of course, people my age started out with typewriters, and they were an, an innovation. When typewriters were created, if you do a little research, you're going to find out that people said a lot of the same things they say about computers now. Typewriters are going to put people out of work. They're going to put a lot of women out of work. Um, it's just going to change society. We need to stop this. You hear a lot of the same rhetoric when you hear about the Internet. Of course, it's a bigger scale now, but it was a huge deal. The typewriter was going to cause an uproar in the job place. What are we going to do without the women that are typing because they do so many other things and if they're not, you know, if they're not uh, taking dictation, I meant not typing, if they're not taking dictation, they're also the assistant, what are they going to do? And it also created a person that did nothing but typing. They hadn't had that kind of thing before. There was, the secretary was somebody that actually was an assistant early on and people thought it would change society completely. Remember a typewriter is mechanical. It says here, completely analog. <clears throat> it had a ribbon called that kind of wound across the front of the paper in one direction. Could be a reel here and a reel here. And that ribbon, of course, had ink on it. And the keys would strike that ribbon. Then there would be paper behind it. And the letter would... would would be uh, shown. Of course, you couldn't change the type, the way it looked. It was, the keys were kind of embedded in there. You couldn't do a lot of things we can do today. They usually, in the early days, only had upper or lower case, not both. Then they got a little more sophisticated and ended up with both. <clears throat> and then later on, there was a ribbon that had red, two, two shades of ink on it if you wanted to, and so forth. But it was still a mechanical device. 
We'll talk a little more about this later, but I wanted to just mention real quickly what's known as the QWERTY keyboard board, QWERTY from the uh, letters up here that start the keyboard, Q-W-E-R-T-Y, QWERTY. A keyboard was developed for the typewriter. And other keyboard layouts, you ever wonder why the keyboard is laid out like it is? There were other layouts invented for the typewriter so that women could type faster. And I mean women, that's about all that did the typing in the, in the early days. Um, and the keyboards were very efficient. One of them is this one, the Dvorak keyboard. Mr. Dvorak um, did, a, did an analysis of the English language, figured out which letters are typed the most, <clears throat> and he put those letters around the strongest fingers, the, the index finger, the middle finger, and then he put the letters used the least next to the little finger and the ring finger on both hands. And he thought that would, of course, uh, speed things up, and it did. Unfortunately, the typewriter couldn't keep up with that speed and the keys were sticking, they were breaking the typewriters. So people decided that wasn't such a good idea um, and they switched back to the QWERTY keyboard, which essentially is the worst layout they could devise because they wanted to slow down the typist. Makes you wonder, here we are, we have this computer that runs at the speed of light now and we have this keyboard that was designed the worst way possible to slow down a mechanical device. You might think about, why don't we use the Dvorak keyboard? <clears throat> we are stuck with the QWERTY keyboard. That isn't going to change anytime soon. So early line editors or text editors worked in a way that probably most of you aren't familiar with. It would display a line for you. And you would have to actually type below the line, not on the characters themselves like you're used to in Word. And you would have to put things like M for modify or C for change, and then you would type the characters and it would overlay the characters on the line above. Uh, you couldn't move the cursor around in these, of course, because you weren't using uh, a GUI, a screen-based software system. You were using a text-based. So you couldn't just move the cursor around and change things. There were commands, imagine that, to decide where you would be in the document. You moved the cursor with commands. What you see here is, is by, and here you can see some of the commands here. Replace character, R. Move a line up, K. So you had to type a K, move, and you could go up and edit the line above the one you're at. Now, by is still used in Unix systems. Still used today because Unix people like that kind of thing, and, and it's, it's improved, of course. Now it has a better interface, GUI interface. But the commands are the same, and it works in a similar fashion. And over here is an example of what's known as a text editor, not a line editor so much, but a text editor. It's, it's, it's a little difficult to see, I realize, but you can see the different lines, and you couldn't move the cursor around quite as much. Actually, Notepad or WordPad that comes with Windows is I think what you would call a text editor, <clears throat> not a word processor, a text editor. It, it doesn't do what we call WYSIWYG. WYSIWYG is, you've probably heard of this, but let me write it here. What you see is what you get. WYSIWYG. That means that when you change something on the screen, it's, the file is going to look like that. Well, these weren't like that. What you were looking at had nothing to do with the, with the way it would print or the way it would look in another, uh, on another screen or something. It was very arbitrary. There was control characters. There's things embedded in there. And he, what you saw is not what you got when you printed it. And that's one of the key features of this and made it very difficult. Now, it says not an intuitive GUI interface. And it was difficult to use, but it's all there was. So that's what we used. Um, well, I want to go back here to the last slide for a second. Take a look at this link here. There are links in this document meant more as resources for you, not necessarily something for you to remember. 
Um, this particular one, if you're interested, we'll go into a little bit about how you use these things. And you'll see this documentation, if you're interested and if you look at it, it's very technically oriented. It's very counterintuitive. It's, you got to know what they're talking about before it makes a whole lot of sense. But that's what these kinds of editors were designed for because people weren't really typing documents in computers when these were invented. It was more of a case of typing programs and maybe some scripts, those kinds of things, system editing, those kinds of things. Very little real word processing, document processing was being done with these things. If you're interested, you can look at that. The original Unix default editor for email. In news articles, what they're talking about there is something we'll talk about later. Um, um, news groups was a type of communication using the internet before there was such a thing as the web. And we'll talk more about that later. But it was the editor. And you know, if you use Outlook now, you can define which, what software you want to use for your email. And most of us choose Word to do that. That's what they're talking about here. <clears throat> Let's go back to the slides here. And let's go on to the next slide. Talk a little bit about um, what we have now today. Word processors. We're, not, we're no longer processing texts or lines of text. What you see is what you get now. In Word, I know it's not 100%, but it's pretty close. In Word, you can look at a document on the screen the way it's going to look when it prints. If you make a change on the screen, it's going to be reflected in the document. <clears throat> um, and it's what we all are used to. One of the first widely used word processors was something called WordStar. And next was WordPerfect. WordStar was a groundbreaker. It's first one of the first major products in the, in the PC marketplace. Uh, you probably never heard of it unless you're involved in that kind of thing. WordPerfect, you might have heard of. It was the first huge software package known. There were some in the um, spreadsheet world, but WordPerfect was the first really big software package, and it was a word processor. It was gigantic, had huge sales, but Microsoft decided they wanted that market, and they kind of took it away from WordPerfect, and we're going to talk about this in a couple of minutes here. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, WordStar is one of those. Um, I use WordStar early on. Um, one of the first I used word processors, I mean, I used WordStar a little bit, not a whole lot. And you can look through this web page. It's just a resource again. It's a history of WordStar. And you'll see some words in here like CPM. And we're going to talk more about that when we talk about operating systems. CPM was the first widely used um, operating system. In fact, it was Bill Gates' um, I'm sorry, it was IBM's first choice for the operating system for their PCs, for their computers. And we'll talk about why it didn't end up being the choice, and we ended up with Bill Gates software, DOS, it's called MS-DOS, which led to Windows and so forth. But CPM was huge. It was the operating system for a lot of years with PCs. And of course, that's why WordStar grew. It's similar to what happened with Microsoft and IBM and PCs growth and Microsoft growth were so linked. Same thing here. They just failed to keep up as well as Bill Gates does. That, of course, is one of his, always been one of his strengths, keeping up with the marketplace. <clears throat> oh. Yes, close that ink layer. Thank you. And um, you can read through this. It's a little history. If you're interested, um, it was a big deal, WordStar. The control commands in WordStar, in other words, although it was a word processor, you still had to use commands. It still wasn't quite a GUI interface. <clears throat> And here's a list here. And notice this is for DOS, Disk Operating System. We'll talk about the, when we talk about the history of operating systems. DOS was the precursor. It was what made Microsoft Disk Operating System. And you'll be interested to find out why they wrote DOS, they being Bill Gates and a couple of his buddies wrote it while they lived in Albuquerque. Um, but it was an operating system 
that had line commands. Look at these commands. That little carrot you see here means control. So that's control KE. That's how you rename the file in Word Star. Oh my goodness. Wouldn't you just rename it? No. Copy file, will you type control KL or just the letter O, capital O, in fact and so forth. You can see all these things. Exit to operating system X. Delete file. Well, Y. <clears throat> but of course you had to be in the right mode to type Y because you had to type Y in other modes. So you had to switch modes and say I am now in entering mode. I'm actually entering text for my document. Or you could say I'm in text mode, I'm in command mode, and then when you're in command mode, a Y mean, you know, it's very confusing. How would you like to work that way? But we, we didn't have any choice. Um, Some of the, you can see the commands here. Move the cursor up a line, control E, capital E to be specific, and so forth. You can take a look at that if you're interested. But some of these commands and some of the commands we use now, like <clears throat> if you use them, uh, not everybody uses them, but control C to copy, control S, control uh, X, those things came from these days. They're holdovers from the days when we had to enter those, not necessarily these commands. But uh, the idea of a command <coughs> control something, that's a holdover from those days. And Microsoft, one of the things they're very good at is copying and ripping off from other people, and that's where they got the idea. In fact, some of the first editions of MS Word, Microsoft Word, allowed you to tell Word, I want you to run like WordStar runs. And it would do that. I mean, that's, you know, we miss it now. We don't see it now because Microsoft has so few competitors. But of course, that's why eventually Microsoft took over the word processing market. They said, this is a better package, but if you want to run the way WordStar did, we can do that too. So they not only wrote the word processor, they wrote it to emulate the other word processors that people had already purchased. So if you'd say, well, I don't want to switch to Word. I, I have all these commands memorized for WordStar. Well, it didn't matter. You could still use those commands <clears throat> if you chose. WordPerfect then supplanted WordStar mainly because it was the first major uh, word processing program written for Windows rather than DOS. It was the first real GUI type interface, although it, wasn't, it still had a lot of the holdover commands. <clears throat> the company still exists. Let's take a look at their website. Uh, they, they were purchased, I don't remember how many years ago, by Novell, the network company. And, but they still do exist. They still have sales. You can still buy WordPerfect if you choose. Here's a history. I'm not going to go into it. But it was a gigantic product. It just blew WordStar out of the water. It was the only thing available for a long time, much like Word is now. But again, Microsoft did what they do and figured out how to replace WordPerfect. There were some problems with WordPerfect in, in terms of being able to see what WYSIWYG uh, didn't work real well. There was some commands that were really tedious. You had to use three fingers. There were some issues in the early days. And Microsoft, of course, um, made sure their software didn't do that. Um, Microsoft put a spell checker in their software and a lot of other things. They also, as in WordStar, put an emulator in their software. <clears throat> And I believe, at least a couple of years ago, I haven't checked lately, that the Word comes with a WordPerfect emulator for still. Maybe not 2007, but uh, 2003 I'm pretty sure did. You could emulate WordPerfect, so if you knew WordPerfect, you could use those same control commands. Um, but WordPerfect, you don't hear much about it these days, of course, because Microsoft has taken over. I want to mention, before we get into Microsoft Word, which is what you have to do your assignment in, I want to mention another alternative, OpenOffice. OpenOffice is free. It competes with Microsoft Office. It was developed, I believe, by Google, <clears throat> although you won't see their name on it you know, as a brand name or anything, but I believe they spent a lot of the money to develop it. It's what's known as open source program. We'll talk more about that later when we talk about programming languages and application software. But what that means is they not only give you the program to run, 
they give you the commands that make it run so you can change it if you want to. <clears throat> Most of us don't want to, but there are people out there that want to. And the advantage of that open source is that you, there's uh, blogs, websites you can go to and say, I want open office to do such and such. I'd like it to always capitalize this word or something. And if somebody is interested that there is a programmer, they can add that and send it to you and say, here you go, add this to your source code to your open office and it will now do what you ask it to do. And, and it's all free, no charge, um, and it's just completely changeable. And the reason people develop these things, especially in this case, Google made so much money that owners felt like they needed to give stuff back. So they developed this as an alternative to Microsoft. This software will take Microsoft files as input and then you can modify it in their software and save it back as Microsoft format if you want to. I've used it a couple times to, uh, in the past when students submit things in formats I can't handle and I try to use this to convert it. Works fairly well. It's free. You can download it. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the uh, download site here. Um, if, you know, it's an alternative to Microsoft. And a lot of people are using it, especially people that used to use Macs, people that use Unix systems that just don't like Windows, they don't like Microsoft, so they use this alternative instead just kind of as a protest in one sense. Uh, you notice it says Writer, that's comparable to Word. Calc, obviously Excel. Impress, that's PowerPoint. <clears throat> Draw. Uh, Microsoft has a product I can't remember at the moment. Base is the database, of course. And then it has a math emulator, which allows you to do math equations and so math symbols and those kinds of things. Free. Download it right here. Notice you can export PDFs with this thing. Usually you have to pay Adobe and buy software to be able to do that. Well, OpenOffice will do it for you. They have advanced options of that Microsoft Office. In other words, you can do everything you can do in Office with this thing. There's templates, and this is what I was talking about earlier, the advantage of open source type things. People develop stuff, and then you can share it and use it as you want to. And you can see it so forth. You can edit Excel, Word, PowerPoint documents, so forth and so on. <clears throat> Quite a thing. I wanted to mention that because it's a, it's a growing trend um, to use open source with information technology, and this is a great example of that. <clears throat> I'm not going to play this whole video, and I don't think it's going to play very well, but I want to give you a taste of this video in case you're not aware almost anything can be trained through YouTube. Probably most of you are aware of this, but if you do a search on YouTube, you can find almost anything. And don't worry if you can't hear this. I just want to give you a taste of this. And, of course, the link's here in the file if you want to watch it yourself. Um, this is a woman at Google doing a training seminar in open office. And it's like 45 minutes long, so I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to play a couple seconds here. Um, this was last year. No, this is not. If you're interested, now you can, I'll bet. Uh, just hint, you can find uh, tutorials out here for Word, Excel, Access, and so forth. In case you didn't know that, something you might think about. <clears throat> but here's one training in Office if you're interested in finding out about that. Close that. If you want to watch the whole thing, go ahead and uh, look at the file and bring it up. Finally, the Microsoft Word. It's on over 90% of the computers in the world. I'd like to have that market. That's an incredible thing to think about. Of course, we said computers. I don't know about computing power, but, you know, every laptop counts as one. Every mainframe counts as one. By numbers, over 90% of the computers in the world. We'll talk more about it later, specifics and how to use it and so forth. <clears throat> I just wanted you to see this list. There are options. You don't have to use Microsoft Office. Why do we use it? Well, I use it because it's, it's standard. When I'm at work, I don't want to think about, well, is, is somebody I hire going to know Word or not? I don't really want somebody that knows Global Office. 
I don't use that. Now it's nice to know there's options and then you can go down here and find out more of these if you want to. Notice Mozilla, who is a company, a nonprofit, that has an alternative browser to Microsoft's browser, Mozilla. <clears throat> used to be called Gorilla, now it's called Mozilla because they, they combine with another one called Mosaic, Mozilla. Anyhow, they have their own word processor, but you can also see something called WPS Office 2003. I'm not sure what that is. I just wanted you to see a list. These things are available if you're interested. You can go out and find them, get a list, and use some of them. <clears throat> okay, let's move on. I also want to talk about the Macintosh. Although it holds less than 10% of the marketplace, obviously, if, Microsoft, if uh, Word, Intel, Windows holds over 90%, Macintosh obviously holds less than 10%. But let's look at the word processors available for the Mac. There's a heck of a lot of them. Uh, and this is a review of some of them at the, on this website. This is a very um, important resource, if you don't know, CNET. It's objective, although they do take some money from advertisers, but they're, rel they're usually very objective about what they're reviewing. Um, and you have to be careful because they may have an ad that has nothing to do with their reviews, that, but they get paid revenue, so they put it up there. Um, let me go back here. And look, a couple of these. Notice best Mac downloads. Well, lo and behold, we have Microsoft Word 2004 for Mac. So you can use Word on the Mac. Some people feel like, well, I don't use Word because you can't use it on the Mac. Well, that's not true. It is made for the Mac. And Microsoft had to write another program to make that work, but they did it. Uh, here's some others, Final Draft, uh, Paint, Write, Play. You can see, you can look at this list if you have a Mac and you're interested in finding out about other ways to use it. Here's Microsoft Word 2008 for the Mac. Quark is a desktop publishing software. Remember, uh, well, we haven't discussed it yet, but the Mac was known most for, Word, for um, graphics, publishing, uh, print stuff. It was just an, an excellent, and you couldn't do it on the um, Windows Intel systems, and that, that's where Mac got its reputation. It used to do things that you couldn't do in other systems. Not really true anymore. <clears throat> but it's now become a matter of taste for most people. Let me switch back over here. All right. What happens in a word processor? And like I said, this is just going to be real quick, so maybe you can think about this while you're doing your assignment or maybe when you're posting to the conferences or something. <clears throat> and this is, a lot of this is going to be new. That's okay. You get a box from the store or you download a file or something. Inside here is a disk, DVD these days usually. Well, what's on there? Have you thought about it? We haven't covered much, but we have covered some things. Obviously, there are files on here. Files are um, one set of data put together as a unit with a name. That's a file on a disk. We'll talk about that when we talk about storage. Don't worry about how that's stored. And those files include what we call a program. written by a human being. In fact, with these programs, they're written by a team of human beings, not just one. They're just too massively big to be written by one, one programmer. It's an incredibly uh, complex project, and you have to have a lot of skill to manage those types of projects. And um, it's very enjoyable to do those things. I've done some of that in, in the past with Kinko's and, and supermarkets and things. It's, it's a lot of fun. <clears throat> I started as a programmer, but moved out of that. I, I, am, I am not the best programmer in the world. I enjoyed it, but I just um, reached my limit, and I knew it, and I wanted to do more and manage. It was more interesting to me. And I also wanted to talk to the uh, business folks. I wanted to learn that end as well as the technical. Anyhow, 
on there is a program. What's a program? It, all right, it is a file. What's in that file? The file is like a, a drawer in your file, or a folder in your filing cabinet. Think of it like that. Well, what's in there is a set of instructions. Telling the computer what to do. OK? Now, we've got it at this box. We've got a disk. And there's a bunch of instructions on it. What now? Well, you take that disk out of the box, put it into the um, slot on your computer there, the DVD drive, or it might be CD drive, either one. And there's a little program on there that says, open this disk and do something. And there's a, what's called a load program runs, which takes all the necessary files off that disk for you. Where do you think they go? Well, got our little slot. We have a computer. I just get my prop here. Got this computer here. We have a disk in it. I know that's hard to see, but you get the idea. And it just sits there. So what? What's going to happen now? Well, we have to run that program. How do we do that? Well, we're not going to run it from that disk. It's not the way it works. You take that disk. You may remember I said the first place everything on a computer has to go something called random access memory or RAM. So all these instructions, all these files go into RAM. That's a component on the motherboard. And the thing about RAM, about memory is, when you turn your computer off, whatever's stored there goes away. We're going to cover this in more detail later. I just wanted to kind of go over it quickly tonight. It's volatile. That means no power, no memory. So what the heck good does it do us to take all these instructions or program put them in RAM? Well, it doesn't do us a heck of a lot of good, but it's necessary because that's how the computer knows, understands, and does things. But of course, as you know, the hard disk is where the program ends up eventually. It goes through RAM, but it gets written to the hard disk during installation. Can't spell installation tonight. OK. It gets written during installation <clears throat> to the hard disk, where it stays. And the operating system knows where it is. You don't have to keep track of it. And Something called an icon, a little picture of Word is put somewhere in your computer. And to run that, all you do is click that icon, which goes through RAM, tells the computer to run this program. When you run that program, it's moved from the hard disk to RAM or loaded. And it's executed here in RAM. OK? It's executed there in RAM. And remember, we're going to go over this in more detail later. I kind of wanted to just expose you to it a little bit in a context that means something to you. You have to do an assignment with this software. <clears throat> so it's executed here in RAM. And when you're over here on the keyboard, typing in your resume, where do you think those keystrokes go? 
Think they go right to the hard disk? Well, no, of course not. They go through Word in RAM, then they go to the hard disk. This is why if you're working on something that's very important to you, you should periodically save it. Because what you're working on now, today, on the keyboard, is all here. And if you have a power outage at your house, after you've worked for nine hours on your resume, or paper, term paper, you've lost everything in RAM. So, what you want to do periodically is save your file, a copy of your file, is stored over here by Word in a format Word understands. It's a specific format for Word. And you can retrieve it later. You can lose power and everything over here is non-volatile. Which means if the power goes off, it's kept. So periodically save what you're working on, which will move it from RAM, a copy, to the hard storage so it's saved in case you lose your computer crashes. In fact, if your computer reboots, um, you lose what's in RAM also within limits. So you get the idea. That's what's happening. You're working over here. Everything you're doing is in RAM. At the end, that's why when you exit Word, if you haven't saved your document, it'll ask you, do you want to save this document? You probably should say yes, but it depends on what you're doing. So when you save it, you give it some name with a dot. They call this an extension. Ex extension. And Word uses the extent file extension. It's called dot doc for document, short for document. When you see this extension, it usually means it's a Word document. <clears throat> well, that's a quick run through of what happens um, when you're working with a word processor. And I wanted you to see that. Let me go back over here. Didn't mean to leave that so quickly. Um, just to give you some understanding of what's going on, and I, as I said earlier, we're going to cover that more as we go into operating systems, applications, software, and so forth. I just wanted to run through it real quickly here. <clears throat> All right. More importantly, we'll go back over here. Move on. Assignment one. I'm going to go over now the requirements, what I'm expecting of you for this assignment. Then I'll do, uh, I'll, we'll cover how to do some of it, maybe all of it, in Word. I hate doing work for you, so you're going to have to, I'll, I'll do part of it for you. You've got to do the rest. And for some of you, this is going to be easy anyways. But for those of you that it isn't, keep in mind that you can contact me. You can post uh, <clears throat> messages in the open forum part of the uh, classroom, and I will answer them, or your colleagues, your fellow students will answer them. We can work things out. But if you don't ask questions, of course, I don't know you're having a problem. That's not good. So let me know. Let's communicate. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Here's the assignment. And I'm sure you've all read it by now. I want you to write a 1,600 word paper. And I'll show you how to count words in uh, Word. There's a tool to do that for you so you'll know if you have 1,600 words. Um, and I want you to use one of these people. These are some people I think are important. There's a lot of other important people, too. But I think these people are important, and they're also kind of interesting to me. Maybe not so interesting to you. But one of these people should be interesting to you, I think. Let's take a look at who these people are. Alan Turing, father of computing in some senses. And we'll talk more about him in a minute. Admiral Grace Hopper, woman that developed the programming language called COBOL. Marvin Minsky, the father of artificial intelligence, still alive, I believe. Marshall McLuhan took a look, although he called it media, he took a look at technology and how it's infecting us, <laughs> infecting us, whew, affecting us. And Neil Postman is an educator, and I really like what he writes. Some people disagree with him, that's fine. 
and Countess Lovelace. We'll talk about these people a little bit. First one I want to talk about is Alan Turing. Well, the word Alan Turing, one of the things he did, which isn't up here, is develop the computer. He realized you needed some kind of, I don't know, some kind of uh, memory maybe. Yeah, you need memory. And you need some kind of input so that people can communicate. And then you need some kind of processor to actually do stuff. And uh, then you need stuff, place to store things in between times you were doing things. Of course, when he came up with those ideas, there was no such thing as memory or hard disks. But, you know, there was electricity, but there was no such thing as computers. But that's quite remarkable. There's also a guy named Van Neumann who did a lot of that as well. But we're talking about touring here. Here's a picture of Alan in his backyard. He was also a track athlete as well as a genius. And just, uh, I'm not sure, you can read this Dilbert joke here. The security audit accidentally locked out all of the developers out of the system. That's the kind of thing we're getting to these days. We have security so secure nobody can do anything. And this idiot boss, as you know, in Dilbert, well, it is what it is. How does that help? You don't know what you don't know. Congratulations. You're the first human to fail the Turing test. Well, if you want to write your paper in Turing, you can find out um, what the Turing test is. But it had to do with artificial intelligence and figuring out uh, if the computer was intelligent or not. <laughs> That was one of the things he worked on. He was also, some people call him the father of artificial intelligence, Minsky as well, but some people call Alan Turing. Um, <clears throat> and he says, what does that mean? It is what it is. Why didn't you say that in the first place? Anyhow, the word Turing is part of the English language, perhaps not in your day-to-day -day life, but technical people will know something about it or have heard it before. Alan's an interesting man over here. What you see is the Enigma machine. Alan Turing broke the code of the Enigma machine. He was on the team. I shouldn't say he did it by himself. There was a team of people, but he was the driving force, and most of them just got out of his way, helped him if he needed help. But this is the device the Germans used in World War II to send code. They would type in what they were typing, in other words, the message, and it would convert the message to some gobbledygook, <clears throat> essentially code it, in essence code it. And then they had these code wheels over here. And you'd switch the wheel depending on the day, the code of the day. And um, then you, you would type the code with that wheel or you would decode the code with that wheel. Just like, you know, Commander Cody, uh, Mickey Mouse, code rings. Of course, that's a little before most of your time, but uh, pretty basic stuff today, but it wasn't then. It was an insurmountable code, and um, Alan Turing and the team he led figured it broke the code, which meant, of course, we could tell when they were doing things and so forth. Similar thing happened in the Pacific. The Japanese used a coding machine we broke, but that allowed us to know the, uh, Germ what the German actions were going to be and so forth, where their commanders were going to be, and we could target their commanders and so forth and so on. This machine, by the way, if you've ever seen the James Bond movie uh, From Russia with Love, that looks a lot like what James Bond is carrying out of Russia, when, or Turkey actually, I think. When he leaves Turkey, that's what he's carrying. <clears throat> I think they, I don't know if they call it Enigma in there. They might. But it's a similar looking thing. It's got a wooden box and a keyboard and the whole thing. Alan Turing did that. Artificial intelligence, the Turing test, a lot of other things. Unfortunately, he was a homosexual and that um, at the time was not good for security. And he had an <clears throat> unusual ending. And he was discredited for a lot of years. And then the British government realized they did a bad thing to him. And they built this statue to him to commemorate Alan Terry and all the good things he did to try to rehabilitate his image. But he's an interesting man, and you might want to write about that. But you'll find out more, of course. I'm only scratching the surface here. Admiral Grace Hopper, early picture of her in her Navy uniform. 
She was a mechanical genius, there's no question about it. Her parents talk about her taking apart watches when she was six or seven and putting them back together. I took apart watches, but I couldn't put them back together. Um, and this is her working on the computer. And she developed a programming language, as I mentioned, the Navy for the Navy. And she retired, and they begged her to come back. And she did, and they made her an admiral. She's a rear admiral by the time she retired for all her work with the Navy. And down below here is the ship named after her. I think it's the USS Hopper. He was named before or after she died, but I'm not sure. Find out if you want to write about her. One of the brilliant minds in the early computer development. We wouldn't be where we are without her. By the way, you might have heard this term. A bug is something wrong with your program. It isn't working right. And she developed that term. And if you're interested, you could find out about where that term comes from. It's even more remarkable, of course, for in those days, there were no men in this field at all. It's only been the last 10 years where there's been men, or women in the field. So she's even more remarkable than it may seem at first. <clears throat> Marvin Minsky is at MIT. And he believes thoroughly that we're going to be able to write, develop a computer that's intelligent. Because he has a foundation, he, a belief, I'm going to call it a belief, because that's really what it is, uh, that the human brain is a machine. We're programmed with one program when we're born, which is to, take, to not hurt and eat and stay warm and so forth. That's about it. But that program remembers behavior that got us something we wanted, and that becomes our personality. So the experiences we have make us different. It's not that we're all the same, according to him. It's just that we all come with the same basic programming when we're young. Our experiences is what make us different. But more than that, he doesn't believe in the, such a thing as free will. He believes everything we do happens because of all these programs. As we, as we mature, as we age, we have so many programs in there that we uh, learn different ways to please ourselves, different ways to be where we want to be, and we choose what to do. And it's, it's all not choice. It kind of happens so fast, it's just a part of the brain pr process. And he feels you can do that with a computer. I know most of you think that's not very interesting, but you might find some interesting things. Uh, there's uh, books written about him, science fiction books written about him as a character. And this is the book most recently he's known for, because it was kind of a bestseller. And it's about uh, just what I was talking about. It's, a, it's, a very, it's not highly technical if you're interested. And um, it'll go through his belief system and the, how the brain works and so forth. And I'm simplifying, of course. He's done other things as well, and you might want to, um, he's an interesting man. He also has a great sense of humor. <clears throat> Marshall McLuhan wrote a book called The Medium is the Mess, is the, well, this says massage, should say message. Um, and that book, it's, it's hard to describe. There's one, another one called The Global Village about how media and technology is shrinking the world. And this is back in the 50s we're talking about. <clears throat> this book, this version of it, obviously was written in the 70s, as you can see by the cover. Um, but he believes that uh, what's going on around us, this media, television, um, is transcending the content. In other words, the fact that there's a light bulb is a message to people who've never seen a light bulb. It's, it's, it's a difficult concept, but <clears throat> these are interesting questions he's asking about technology. What does it extend? In other words, what does it take what we do today and extend it? Let's think about that for a minute. And this is what I think is important for us to do, is think about what technology does. What does it make obsolete? Are there jobs that are going to become obsolete? Or is it just talking to grandpa? Maybe the beliefs that are passed down from generation to generation don't have to be passed down. Those are the issues people need to think about. Are there new opportunities? Obviously, you need to think about that with technology. And what does it reverse into when over, in other words, when it can't handle what it's supposed to handle, what does it go back to? What, what, what is the fallback? Sounds complicated, but he's a very interesting man. He uh, actually was in a Woody Allen movie called Annie Hall, played himself. 
And uh, Woody Allen argues about what Marshall McLuhan said. And that's a joke and the fact that it's hard to understand him, but he argued with the author himself. But he was very important in the uh, 70s, 80s, his concepts of media and what it's doing to us, for us, are still are still very important. I'm trying to find the right slide here for you. Going a little, there we go. Neil Postman's an educator. <laughs> and those of us that educate, some of us probably don't like this statement. 90% of all that goes on in schools is practically useless. Pretty harsh statement, and I don't know that he really means things when he says them like that, but <clears throat> what he's trying to say is a lot of what we do is ritual. A lot of what we do is because we've done it before. A lot of what we do is just because. And he's getting, trying to get us to think about those things. And his, his key concept is think about how the technology, the media affects us. How is it changing things? Is it a good way? What, what, what are we using it for? Are we just letting it use us? And this is what he gets at. <laughs> This book, uh, I have a copy of that book. I've read that book about how the, the technology is making um, childhood disappear. And I think we can all see that. And he explains in the book in a little more detail. I mean, we can all kind of see that to some extent. We just don't quite understand how that's happening. And this book talks about how the technology is doing that. And you might find that interesting. I, li I like this book as well, Amusing Ourselves to Death. He talks about the Hollywood um, entertainment culture we have and how it's forcing us not to really think about the things that are important. Um, and he talks about uh, talk shows and a lot of interesting things that I think are interesting. You may not. Wired Taste, I think he's an interesting man. I'm trying to get something for everybody here. Countess Lovelace. It's kind of interesting, you know, we see these uh, drawings of people from uh, years ago, and she was in the 1800s. Here's a photograph of her. She looks a little different in the photograph, doesn't she? Anyhow, so when you see these drawings of people, keep in mind that the artist wanted to get paid. So they're usually not very accurate. <clears throat> if someone isn't good looking, it's a problem. Anyhow, um, Countess Lovelace, Augusta Ada, and Ada, there's a programming language developed named after her called Ada. Military used to use it a lot. It was um, what's called parallel processing language. And don't worry about that. But just remember there's a language named after her. <clears throat> her father was Lord Byron, the poet, who ran away to Greece to join the Civil War there and was very romantic and wrote this incredibly romantic poetry. Her mother didn't want her to be that way, so her mother taught her math because she didn't want her to be like her father. <clears throat> she didn't know her father that well, but um, he was her father. This is, uh, I think it's Charles Babbage. Get this spelled right. B-B-A-G-E. Mr. Babbage developed this machine here called the Difference Engine and it ran on steam. And it was kind of, um, if you will, an electronic abacus. That's really what it was. It counted things. It did, uh, he could do mathematical stuff with it. Um, he designed it. He never built it, unfortunately. Uh, this, I, I don't know if this pic picture is, but there's a museum in Munich where you can go and they built the machine on his specs and it does work and it runs on steam and you can watch it running there. They don't run it often but you can see it anyway, stand next to it. It's huge. As tall as this, this room and probably about seven, eight feet wide. It's, it's very big. It looks a little bit like a Borg device in this picture but it's not. It's a device that moves slots depending on numbers and does computations, can compare. It's a computer. It's essentially what it is. Um, <clears throat> This man's name is Bool. You might have heard of Boolean logic or Boolean algebra. This is the man that developed that. Well, he's on this page because he hired her to program this. And she was a brilliant mathematician. 
So she did. And uh, of course, she never could see the program run because there was no machine to do it on, but she, she did develop the program, the operating system, if you will. And she was the first programmer in history. Quite interesting that the first programmer in history was a woman. I think that might surprise some people. So she's kind of an interesting topic if you're interested in writing on that. <laughs> All right. Let's talk specifics here. I hesitated doing this, but I did include it because um, I work in the distance ed department and I want to um, make the program a little better. And one of the things we're finding is a lot of people end up not knowing about this library. It's a great resource that you can use. It has thousands and thousands of references, articles, magazines, all kinds of things. <clears throat> so after talking it over with George Becker and, and the, you know, the director of the MST program, Ivor Davidson, the uh, director of the distance ed program, actually George is a coordinator, I guess. But anyhow, he, he, he makes decisions on the program. We decided it might be a good idea to include this teaching you how to use the library as a basic. So this course could kind of lead you into that for your other courses, so you could do some research. <clears throat> and a lot of you are probably asking, how do I do that? I'm going to I'm going to get you started here. Um, but there's a, so you have some understanding of how to do this, and then you can run through the tutorials online on the library and recorded by the library and here in this room. And then, if you have questions, you can post them in the uh, open forum conference uh, in the uh, classroom. And then we can all talk about it and help each other find what we're looking for here. So we'll go over that in just a second. <clears throat> Wikipedia is not a reference. That's ridiculous. Wikipedia has no validity whatsoever. You can put anything you want in there. There's nobody overlooking it. It's the open source version of um, information. We all use it occasionally when we're in a hurry. But as a reference for a paper, it just, no, it, it doesn't, doesn't work. <clears throat> um, got the portal up here. What I want to do here is show you real quick Here's the distance education website, distance.nmt.edu. If you go to the bottom of the page, and this may change in the future, but somewhere on this page, you'll see a box, online library access provided to DE students. Now, this may change, as I said, in the future if we redesign the web page. But for now, somewhere, it'll take you to this, this page. A lot of information on this page. Let me wait. Uh, let the server catch up here. Here we go. Um, and you can read through this. I'm not going to go through it tonight. But I'll, I just wanted to show you down here tutorials. Click on these links, and the librarian, assistant librarian, I believe she is, uh, will talk you through uh, using the online library. <clears throat> okay? I just wanted to go over that briefly, show you this page, show you the tutorials, and if you need more, of course, we'll discuss it in the open forum in the classroom or call me, email me. I'd prefer to try to use the uh, conferences so that everybody benefits from the discussion. <clears throat> okay, let's just go through the requirements. One inch top and bottom, measure the margin from the top of the header. In the bottom of the footers, in other words, it has to be an inch. A header is, uh, is, is what is, is at the top. Here's a footer. It appears at the bottom of every page, so it's called a footer. We go back up here. Whoops. This is a header. I only had to type this in once, and it appears on every page, OK? <clears throat> Let's let the server catch up a little bit here. OK, header footer.
So two references from the library, online library, and other references as you use them. Um, one inch top and bottom margin above the header and below the footer. One half inch on each side, so that would be a half inch over here, half inch here, one inch here, one inch here. Make sense? Um, do not use double spacing anywhere. Use one and a half line spacing. If you want to use single spacing, you can, but use one and a half spacing somewhere. Use a header. And you saw the example of my header a minute ago. Footer, date, page count, and so forth. There's a function built into Word that will give you the number of total number of pages as well as the current page number. We'll look at that. Um, I'm going I'm to demo most of this. I just want to go through it first. Um, justified text. Well, most of the text you're going to do in here is what is known as left justified which means the lines in the document go like this. And this side is, is called, is ragged. That's left justified, okay? Well, justified or fully justified, both sides are even. Well, how do you do that? Does that mean you gotta put spaces? Nah, you just tell Word you want it that way and it, and it spreads everything out so they're even on both sides. That's justified. <clears throat> Use two different font types. We'll go over that. A font is from the old printing press days, but a font is uh, the style of the print, the way it appears on the document. <clears throat> and we'll talk about different, how to get different fonts in there. You must use two different ones. Um, throughout your document, Make the font size 12. Font is actually a type, size is another thing. Um, and I want you to use a sans serif typeface. And here's an example of one, MS Sans or Arial. I'll show you these in a minute, we'll go over it. I want you to use one uh, typeface and size 16 instead of 12. 12 is what I want you to use most of the time. You have to use one, at least it's bigger than 16. I want you to underline something, bold face, italic. Superscript, here's an example of superscript. Something degrees. Usually you see degrees is, well that's also superscript, but I just used that one so you could see what it looks like. <clears throat> a bulleted checklist, well this is a bulleted checklist. Probably most of you know how to do this stuff, but this is a good review. Um, I just wanted a checklist somewhere in the document, not throughout the whole document. I want you to create a table. Here's a table with one, two, three columns. And this one actually has two rows of content and a title row. These are columns, these are rows. And we're gonna go over how to create that table in a little bit. I want you to have a footnote. It can reference something if you want it to, but just a footnote saying this R a footnote is enough. I want a picture or graphic of some kind inserted in the document. <clears throat> If I'm not mistaken, that might be it. Okay. Here's how I'm going to grade your paper, and you all have this PDF. But just to go over it real quick, what you say is 40% of your grade. You can see here, did you address the topic? It says full five pages, I need to change that. 1,600 words. I'll make that change when I'm done here. Um, excluding the title page and bibliography. 
they'll try to pad the pages with extra margins and so forth and so on. That's very irritating. You know that, your teachers. You want people to do the work, not try to get out of it. 1,600 words isn't that much. Uh, this is very important, and some of you know why. But I don't want you to submit a paper from a previous class. Just write it on a different topic. You should have learned all the editing functions before if you had another uh, paper. But write it on somebody else. I will not accept a paper that's a duplicate of something you did before. <clears throat> And then 40% of your grade is, is all this stuff we just talked about, the formatting. 20% is your bibliography. Did you use two um, from the uh, tech library? That kind of thing. Do the links work? That kind of thing. All right. I want your paper via the online classroom. And as usual, if it is apparent that an individual has submitted the same work as another student or students or has plagiarized their work in any manner, both students will receive a failing grade for this assignment. Not for the class, just for this assignment. Don't hand in the same paper, please. That goes without saying, though. We've got to say it, though, just in case. This is an individual assignment, not a group project. OK. Last thing we're going to do tonight is go through how to do some of these things, if I can find Word in here somewhere. Here it is, Microsoft Office, Word. Now you may have Word 2007. That's fine. It will look a little different. It will operate a little different. But the functions I'm talking about will be there somewhere. I'm going to use 2003 because that's what I have on the system. If you're having trouble finding um, how to do it in 2007, give me a call, post it in the conference. We'll work on it. I did want to do one more thing here in the portal right here is a PDF. If you don't own Microsoft Office, here's a, um, and you want to own it. And remember, you have to have it to complete these assignments. It doesn't mean you have to own it. You can use it at work or something. But if you do want to own it, here's a way to do that. You, mainly, you need an a email address that's .edu, because then Microsoft knows you are a student or an academic person, one way or another. So um, I'm not, I'm not going to go through that. But it's posted in the portal. And if you're interested, you can. Um, Go ahead and use that to get, get, get a cheap price on what we're talking about. All right. So two references to the online library. I'm going over the document now. I've got it printed out. Two other different websites, OK? Let's go through the formatting. File. I hate this one. They don't show everything. Page setup. What do you see there? Margins, top, bottom, left, right. That's good. That'll probably help. There's some other things in here you might want to look at, but I'm not going to go over them. They're very. Here's something you might want to look at, though. Yikes! Well, let me write on that. Anyhow, right here in the middle, hard to see. Header, footer, from edge. I think a half is enough. OK. Spacing. OK. Of course, as you know, these are red underlined because of the spelling. It's misspelled words. But I just wanted something to put in here. Spacing. Usually, when you're talking about those kinds of things in Word, line spacing and so forth, and in most cases in Word, and this is probably a review for most of you. I'm still going to cover it for those of you that it isn't. And you might want to use some of this uh, you know, somewhere else. You highlight what you want to change, format, 
line spacing is generally done under paragraph. A couple of things here. Alignment, we can align things. Left. Centered. That means the same space on both sides. Right means left ragged, right straight. And justified means both sides are straight. There it is. And you can look at some of these others if you want. <clears throat> How much line, space to put before and after the paragraph. Notice I went to paragraph format in case I forgot to mention that. Special. This thing called hanging. Um, and well, that's when the uh, first line in each paragraph is out further to the left than the rest of it. That's hanging. If you're interested in doing that kind of thing. It's not a requirement of this assignment, but in case you wanted to know. So the paragraph looks like this. That's a hanging indent. <clears throat> so I didn't do the one we were talking about. Forgot. Paragraph. Let's see. Line spacing. Sorry. See that then. Single, one and a half, there it is, double, and so forth. I'm making this too easy for you. I'm doing all the work. Of course, most of you, this is probably fairly easy anyways. Header, view, header, footer. Whatever you type in there is going to be on every page. Okay? Let's switch, look at the footer. Right there, switch between header and footer. Whatever you type in there will be in the footer. And I'm going to let you figure out how to put the page numbers in there. I want page blank of blank, and I don't want you to type them. I want you to use the, the formatted function in Word. It's built into Word. We'll get those for you. And it probably has something to do with these icons here in this toolbar. What you see here is what's known as a floating toolbar in Microsoft Office parlance. And of course we use it in other things too, but that's a toolbar and it's floating because it's not attached at the top or the bottom and it goes away when we don't need it. <clears throat> but it is a toolbar. And you can look at some of these things. Oh look, insert page number. You get the idea. Okay, moving on. Footer. Well, I just showed you how to do a footer. Uh, the date as well. You'll find that in one of the in, in the toolbar. Um, okay, we talked about justify. Let's skip. Okay, go back to the fonts here for a second. Format, font, all kinds of them in here. These come with this package. You can actually purchase other fonts, download fonts. There's actually a Starfleet font that you can get that makes it look like the way they print things in Star Trek, if you're interested. <laughs> All kinds of stuff. Let's just pick some weird one. I don't know. Oh, look. There's a sans serif one there. A serif, and it's in the textbook, and you can read it in there when we get to the um, uh, that particular part. Um, a serif is little tick marks at the top of letters in the bottom. Look it up. Google it. Find out what it is. I'm not going to go into it, but you might want to be interested in what that is. I'm just going to find something here that looks weird. Oh, I can't find anything weird. Myriad Web Pro. What the heck is that? So when I click on that, it's going to make the um, type in that type of um, word. I don't know. It looks a little different, I guess. Maybe we need to make this bigger. Let's change format, font. Let's just, for the purposes of what we're doing here, make this a little bigger. 16. OK, that's better. Notice also, you can change, you can uh, magnify. I'm going to change that from 100 to 150. Much bigger, obviously. Put it back at 100. That's how you change the font size and type of font. My favorite is, not sure why. I'm a creature of habit. That's why. Verdana is generally what I use. 
And there's 12. I want you to do that mostly your whole document. And you saw some other fonts in there, like sans serif ones. All right. Um, how do I underline something? I'll just underline this line. Format, font. Underline, no, that's not it. I'm used to doing it the easy way. I'm trying to show you the, uh, that's color, underline, words only. No, I don't want to do that here. I'm going to underline with that line. Okay. So now it's underlined. <clears throat> As in most software these days, there's more than one way I see my camera has turned off and no one's watching. The camera turned off. I wasn't even watching. Okay, I'm back. Okay, we're talking now about the fonts. Um, Underlining text, like most things with computers these days, there's more than one way to do things. Um, one of them is that. Another is to use control. I'm just going to underline this part. Control, I'm holding the control key and pressing U for underline. Now it's underlined. Also, control B is bold. Those are the ones I use most. But you can also do it up here, format, font. Bold, italic. All right. <clears throat> Superscript. I think I see that word up there. Checklist. Now I'm just going to make three of these a checklist. Again, you highlight what you want to format. Format. Bullets and numbering. Well, that's where you do a checklist, bulleted checklist is under bullets. Oh, I always like this one or this one, but I think I'll do that one today. There's a bulleted checklist. This stuff's too easy. I'm making this too easy. Somewhere up at the top, there's a um, place you can click that says table. I'll let you figure the table one. I've got to leave something for you to do. I can't do it all. Okay. That's about all I have. The next lecture is going to be uh, get more into uh, more academic, I mean, more technical type stuff. This one's intended to get you started on your first assignment. I know a lot of you probably already started. This should help a little bit. Don't forget to keep up on the conferences. And if you have any questions, comments, difficulties, call me, contact me. Thanks. See you next time.